Raccoon Man and Drew Conic Sorceress present The Curio Archives Episode 1 Elemental Testing, testing. Can't believe this thing still works. Alright. <clears throat> I'm Knin. Knin Mass. I work for the Curio Institute, London. An organization all about cataloging and researching information about the paranormal and strange. I've been lifted from my previous station to the role of head archivist, following one Icarus Valor, who disappeared one day without a trace. <laughs> Fucking spooky, eh? I've been with the Institute maybe two years now? I was just a research assistant most of the time, and a lot of it was spent sorting through frankly useless paperwork. Half the time I just sat back and marked yes mindlessly and didn't change anything. Most of our work is ineffective. My belief in the supernatural is resolute, but I don't think there's much of anything we can do about it without being it. The very rare cases we get where someone experienced something real can't be bureaucracied through. They require action we can't provide. I sit now in the main archivist room, surrounded by shelves and shelves of neatly placed binders stuffed to the brim with papers. Statements, I gather. My work is mostly already done for me, honestly. The last archivist is much better at this than I will be. As I go through old statements, I will surely make a bit of a mess. All that remains to be finished is whatever new statements come in, and a specific box of statements I left under my table. I found it on my desk on the very first day of work. There are some tapes accompanying some statements as well, not all of them. For my overall ease, I will be recording all the ones in the box onto the tape recorder that's been left behind, the one I'm talking into now. Using my laptop has been... strange. I work with uh, two other people here in the archives, Adele and Orpheus. Adele is an interesting lady. She used to work as an assistant in the same branch as me, and when I got the promotion, I decided she could be helpful, as long as she keeps telling the truth and her penchant for seeking out the supernatural stays minimal. Orpheus is more of an enigma. From the people I've asked, he seems to be related to the last archivist and I get the distinct impression that he's not the happiest with me getting this promotion instead of him. I can't disagree with the guy. Adele will be working alongside our police contracts for whatever information we can find there, Orpheus will be going out to see if he can find the people we take the statements of, and otherwise just find out where they've been and what they're doing. If I'm interested enough, I might do some research into a statement as well. Maybe the mythology behind it, as the supernatural is prone to compare. There's that half of my life story. I guess if we want Supernatural, I can give the other half. Or at least a part of it. How do I start this? Hmm. Statement of Kanin Maz, regarding his childhood and how he obtained his scarred hands. Original statement given August 1st, 2022. Audio recording by Kanin Maz, new head archivist of the Curio Institute. Statement begins. I wouldn't consider my childhood bad, but I certainly wouldn't consider it normal. The two important facts are as follows. One, my dad's the founder of a company. He's not some megacorp CEO, but he's not running it all on his own either. And two, I didn't grow up with two parents. I grew up with seven. From the beginning, I've been used to expectations, and I've been used to people. Each of my parents invited something different onto me, be it my dad's worrying or my step's smoking habits. My family has one big connecting tie, the arts, or similar things therein. Every single one of them, be it my parents or my sister, all have some hobby or art that they focus on and inevitably excel in. Growing up, my dad was my role model, be it his ability to manage hundreds of people and always charm them to his side when I sat in on his meetings, or his ability to sew and quilt, always a blanket around when I felt cold or lonely, kind of like a hug. I couldn't think higher of him. I wanted that strength, that talent. That led into my rebellious streak. Until I was 13, I held that same hero worship for him, but it changed eventually. I became bitter. 
spiteful. Unlike them, there was nothing I was really adept at, and I tried my hand at everything. I could do quilting better than the other things I've tried, but okay wouldn't cut it for me. They didn't make it worse or anything, they tried to tell me it was alright, but I just couldn't see beyond that feeling, that inadequacy. So I started to bite back. I started to fight at my parents and get into trouble. I started to loiter after school, and I started to smoke. I think I was 15 when it happened, when I cut off from my dad during a shopping trip and just started walking away. I came upon an alley, and just wanting to get away from it all, I walked inside and leaned against the wall. I pat myself for the pouch on the inside of my coat where I hide my cigarettes and pulled one out. I looked for a lighter, but couldn't find one. I heard the click of a metal Zippo lighter across from me, and looking up, I saw the man who had changed my life. I never learned his name, not even after everything was done, but I don't think I'll ever be able to forget him. He had platinum blonde hair, long and scraggly down his face. His clothes were fancy, but in a way where you wouldn't be able to tell if you weren't aware of brands and stuff like I was. They looked simple, almost raggedy. Black, tattered pants, white clean shirt, and long, baggy brown trench coat. The entire time I interacted with him, he had this smile on his face. It was full-teethed, fake and clean, but there was this undertone to it all. It was ashy, flaky. His whole being had this feeling that it wouldn't last, that it would fall through into nothing. He held the lighter out to me, it being the only thing lighting up the dark alleyway. All the people who had been walking by on the street had just disappeared. It was just me and this man alone in the world, alone in this alley. I took it. I was a teen, a teen who thought the world didn't understand him and that he was stronger than whatever could be thrown at him. I didn't see anything wrong around me and I didn't want to. I lit my cig and handed it back over to him, and the man just pocketed it. We stood there for a bit, not really looking at each other. I took a few deep drags and then looked up at the man, ready to poke the bear. I asked, what are you here for? The man's smile widened and changed. He responded, it's hot out here, I'm cooling down. His voice was scratchy, like he hadn't had anything to drink in a while. I turned away after that and took another drag. This one was different. It seemed to cloud my mind, smoke becoming my very being. The normal rush of nicotine and dopamine turned into this heady sensation that stole all of my autonomy away from me. The man's smile grew even wider, and he stopped leaning on the wall. He asked me something then. What do you value most about yourself? It sent my brain spiraling. It was a weird question. How does one answer that? How does someone choose what aspect of them that they think is the best? I thought about my father. I thought about his work, how he had raised everything on his own, pulled himself from nothing with his own strength. I thought about how steady he was, how he could make something from simple cloth or scraps that could soothe another person from whatever hardships life had thrown at them. I thought about my family, about each of their talents, how they had trained them and figured them out all on their own, all by their own two hands. I responded, almost outside of myself, my hands. The man's smile almost breached his face, and then the skin began to melt away. The illusion was over. He had me and he no longer needed to hide. Everything that constituted him seemed to fall inward into himself. His skin began to bubble and liquefy, and then slide into the human-shaped mass he was slowly becoming. His clothes caught a blaze almost instantly, then singed and fell to the floor in black charcoal scraps. His hair burned and stunk, and filled the whole area with a sulfurous, ozony odor that almost seemed to cloud in the air visibly. His face fell away, the eyes sinking backwards into these orange dots that held no emotion, but I felt they were almost giddy. 
it couldn't walk, it had no legs, so it sort of slid over. It was a facsimile of a person, a being made of heat and magma I could feel from where I was. As it moved, it singed and charred the pavement below it, and it eventually made it to me. As it stayed there, below my height now, by virtue of it being made of some semi-solid mass, it began to drip and fall onto me. Surprisingly, that didn't hurt when it happened, like it was saving my pain. But where it landed, it burned through what I had been wearing, some dumb band or whatever I thought was cool at the time. It looked at me then, no mouth but shining dots staring into my soul, and placed what had been its hands over and into mine. It burned. The pain was unimaginable. Nerves that should have been singed and removed stayed so I could feel every second as it held on all the way up to my elbow, burning away my arms. It had no mouth, but it was like it was cackling in my ears, the sound of sparks popping through the air. I could feel it as it happened there through the pain, as the molten being went through my flesh down to the bone, and then the bone gone further as it went through me. Even when there was nothing left, when my arms were stubs and the only thing that I could smell, like cooked pork. The phantom sensation never let up. The heat never went away. It looked back up at me. I couldn't move this whole time, my body locked in some easy position for me to be its prey. It tilted its head, almost mocking me, mocking what I had chosen. I blinked, and it was gone. My arms were back. No longer charred husks, but they were ruined. Black and burned and papery, the nails gone and skin only barely held together, only barely moving, only barely functional. The smell reeked. I came back into myself, and I began to scream. Statement ends. There. Half of my experience on file. I'm glad no one will see this. I've never seen the man again, or anything like the magma beast it became. Officially, I am marked down as having run into a nearby burning building to help save the people trapped inside. I'm fine with that being what people think. There was actually a burning building nearby where I was that day. My arms are better now than they were then. I have regained almost full movement but they do lock sometimes or stop responding, and they always ache like hell, all the time, every day. I can't really do anything very dexterous with them anymore, though I do still try to quilt sometimes in very, very small increments. It's amazing I still feel pain in them, but I guess that might have been its last gift. From what I've looked up in sad, pain-filled hazes at night on my phone, this was some form of elemental, or fire spirit. It just so happened to be a masochist or something. There will be no further investigation into this case. I don't want what answers we could find. I don't want to know. God, I need a smoke. End recording. The Curio Archives is a fan work created by Raccoon Man and Druconic Sorceress, based on the Magnus Archives by Rusty Quill. It combines original characters which have made their home on this channel with the elaborate horror universe created by Jonathan Sims. Please support the official release by listening to it on RustyQuill.com, and consider donating to their Patreon. They deserve it. This episode starred Raccoon Man as Kanin Maz, the Archivist. Thanks for listening.